If there's anybody out there, and I can't imagine there is, that doesn't think our country's polarized, you haven't been paying any attention to Donald Trump's success. Uh, it's just about all the proof you need. The divide in America playing out in technicolor on the campaign trail, but also in Congress. Now, all of that is subject of a book called Partisan Divide. It's written by former Democratic Congressman Martin Frost and former Republican Congressman Tom Davis. Earlier today, I spoke with Frost about the realities on both the trail and our Washington. You know, I saw an interesting note, or at least I thought so, um, and it kind of puts in context this election as it relates to what you talked about in the book. Bernie Sanders and Ted Cruz, by voting records, are seen as the two most extreme for their respective party senators um, in Congress right now. And, and to that point, here they are in the conversation, at least, about presidential nominees. Uh, that didn't happen in a vacuum, did it? No, it doesn't. And what's happened is <clears throat> Congress, for a variety of reasons, has really moved to the extremes, just as the American public, uh, by and large, has moved to the extremes in recent years. You have, in the House representatives, you have safe one-party districts 80 percent of the time, so that members have no incentive to compromise. Uh, in fact, if they do compromise in the other, with the other side, they can be attacked uh, in the primary in their own party. Also, the role of money uh, has been very interesting because now you have all these outside groups where you don't even know who's putting up the money in many cases. They can kind of swoop in at the last minute, spend a lot of money, and in a low turnout party primary can make, can make a big difference. You know, one of the things I thought interesting in your book was when you and, and, and your co-author Tom Davis were in Congress, you guys were more worried about in the general who you'd be going up against from the other party. Now, to a person almost seems, they're most worried about who they could be primaried by and who's going to be funding it or bankrolling it, as you talk about in your book. That's relatively new, isn't it? Well, yes, and uh, let, let me give a little background. Tom was chair of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee for four years. I was chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee for four years, though not at the same time. So we didn't go head to head, and so we've remained friends throughout this. But uh, things have changed in recent years, and particularly with the Internet. I mean, uh, the fact that uh, a, a candidate like uh, Bernie Sanders can raise so much money online, o Obama really uh, was the one who pioneered that uh, in 2008. Uh, we all all thought for a long time that a, someone running for president couldn't be financed with small contributions. That's radically different. And also, there is so much information in social media uh, these days that's available. I was fascinated. The uh, one of the, the New York Times ran a piece over the weekend about all the young reporters who are mm -hmm. out covering the presidential candidates and how they are specializing in social media. Something that the uh, the older reporters aren't necessarily as adept in. You're a proud Texan. I'm curious. If I had told you uh, five, ten years ago, Ted Cruz uh, would have been not only in the conversation to become the Republican nominee, but seemingly, albeit grudgingly, by the establishment is maybe the preference to be the candidate at this point, you probably would have called me some unmentionables. I mean, uh, from his time as Solicitor General, who would have ever thought um, we could be in 2016 talking about this guy as a credible candidate to be the United States president? Well, that's the interesting thing, is that uh, Cruz is so unpopular with the elected officials in his own party. Uh, no one in the Senate uh, has been for him up until now, although he may start picking up a few endorsements. I notice that uh, uh, Lindsey Graham said, well, if it comes down to Trump and Cruz, he'd, he'd kind of reluctantly be for Cruz. But you couldn't have a figure like that in the past, who just came from totally outside, who had no support within the establishment, established elected officials of the party. But it's all different now, and it's different because of... Uh, uh, of social media. It's different because of the ability of a candidate like Cruz to raise a lot of money. Uh, and some of it from these, with these super PACs to back his campaign, and it doesn't make any difference what the establishment figures in the party think. That's certainly true with uh, Trump, who's, uh, who's spending his own money. Though, interestingly enough, he hasn't spent very much yet. And if he gets into a very competitive race, he's going to have to open up his own wallet a lot more than he has. Yeah. Uh, actually, he's lending himself money, which, as we know, is very different than spending his own money. Um, to that end, I, one of the things you get from the book is, if you compromise now, it's politically dangerous. It didn't always used to be that way. And with the passing oh. of Nancy Reagan, it brought to mind, uh, you know, uh, the former speaker that you know, Tip O'Neill, he used to have drinks with Ronald Reagan. Now, some folks would call that treasonous, believe it or not. I mean, there's no way to run a government. 
Well, it really is extraordinary. Uh, one of the things we discuss in the book, uh, uh, some of the races that happened recently when uh, uh, Cantor, who was the majority leader of the Republicans, uh, was taken out in the primary because he was seen by some of his more activist right-wing voters as too willing to compromise. We also talk about uh, Pat Roberts, a uh, uh, fellow I served with in the House and is now a senator, a Republican senator, and he uh, had a serious challenge in the Republican primary in Kansas last time from a Tea Party candidate who was not very well known and not very well credentialed. But the fact that Roberts had been willing to work with Democrats uh, in previous years uh, cost him uh, some support and really put his race in jeopardy. Though he did manage to pull it out, he had to work very hard. So compromise is not a good thing these days, whereas compromise used to be how government operated. And I think it should operate that way in the future, and I hope it will. You know, we're starting to see some interesting numbers uh, as it relates to almost a demographic tug of war. Uh, Hispanics may register in record numbers, those that get nationalized between now and the election. Uh, clearly, Donald right. Trump is targeting white voters right now. It, it didn't fit the same uh, demos maybe that we've seen in recent elections. I'm not sure how healthy that is. What do you think? Well, you know, it, I, I've read the stories that uh, Hispanics now, who uh, had been in the country legally but had uh, had not become citizens, have now decided to apply for citizenship uh, so they can vote. Now, that's really directed, of course, at Trump, because they're afraid that if Trump were to be elected president, uh, all kinds of terrible things would happen to them and members of their own family. I, I represented a district in Texas that had a lot of Hispanics. And what you have are mixed families. You have, in one household, you may have some people who are citizens, some people who are here legally and some people who are, are here illegally. And so members, uh, Hispanics are worried about their friends or members of their own family who may be deported if a particular re political result happens. Uh, this is going to be an extraordinary election. The Hispanics uh, have, have gone from 2 percent of the electorate to about 12 percent of the electorate in the last 20 years, in the last, uh, since 1992. Uh, and projections are that there will be even a larger percentage of the electorate this time. And if the Republican candidate, whoever it is, winds up being too extreme, that'll drive Hispanic turnout and could make a big difference in some swing states like Colorado and New Mexico and Nevada, where you have an increasing Hispanic population. Martin Frost, thank you so much for a few minutes. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So, guys, I'll ask you the same question I asked him. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I started the interview by saying Sanders and Cruz are the two most, um, when I say extreme, uh, two most um, certainly uh, from voting records to the far right or to the far left of their respective parties and it's no surprise in this cycle that they're doing pretty well with the electorate for their parties. Do you think it's just a fever that we're in right now about just how much everybody's not only angry but everybody don't want to work with each other that they are the enemy or whatever else um, and it'll pass or is this the new normal? You know, it's funny. I, I put something on my Facebook page, a blog post, that basically said, if, you think, if you're mad that Trump is on the rise, both sides need to look at, at their extremes and figure out what you're willing to give up in order to form more comedy and more compromise in Washington, because there really hasn't been any compromise in Washington. And, and part of it is everybody entrenched in their sort of more extreme positions, but part of it's just a our team versus their team kind of thing. I mean, I think the last bipartisan bill that got passed was the bailout bill which was in 2008, um, you know, Republican or Democrats steamrolled health care through, through Congress. So, you know, that feeds the angry voter that looks at Washington and says nothing is getting done, so I'm going to get this businessman in there because he can get something done, even though we have no idea what he stands for or what he wants to actually do. But do you think after what we've seen with Trump, no matter how this whole thing shakes out, okay, that people are going to say, okay, I let my hair down. I got crazy for a few months back in 2016. <laughs> Let's let cooler heads prevail. You know what? We don't want the kids yelling liar in the middle of the State of the Union anymore and all the other silliness that we've seen here. Uh, let's, let's have some adults go there and do it. Or do you think that this is the new normal? We're going to get maybe not Trump, but somebody else, a reality TV kind of candidates that are going to say and do anything because they've learned you can get free media. What do you think going forward it's going to be? Unfortunately, um, I think we're going to see a, a little more of the Donald Trump types throughout the country. 
<clears throat> that have looked and learned that if I act outrageous and do outrageous things, this will get me on media and perhaps it will work. But I want to piggyback on Andrew's point as well as the congressman, because he's right what the congressman said. Swing states with high uh, Latino vote in Nevada, uh, Colorado, Mexico, we, right, yeah. New Mexico. We don't really understand the impact here. But in states like that, it could be make or break. And I think that we're looking at a new norm, and the norm is this. People are tired of phony politicians. People are going, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to imply that, that this president is phony, but a lot of Americans put their hopes. They saw him as sort of like a John F. Kennedy type and expected for him to do wonders, only to go to Washington and see us as gridlocked as ever. So people are just, they're, they're seeing their jobs go to other countries. You, we talk yeah. about this stuff every night. Cars, American cars, you know, you're, 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 you're making money here and shipping it to another country. But, people are tired. But these tend to go in waves. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll go in one direction where you have the ideological extremism and the gridlock in Washington until something shakes people into saying, we can't do this anymore. Now, we thought that might have been the government shutdown or it might have been the threats for the debt limit default or any number of other really bad policy moves that we've seen in Washington over the last few years. Maybe it's the rise and fall of Trump. And before you, see, you, you predict too many Trump copycats, let's see how it all shakes out for him in the long run. I mean, if he winds up getting stomped on Election Day in November, I don't think there'll be as many people rushing to be that kind of candidate. Well, we talked a lot about Trump tonight. And on the other side of the break, we're going to stay on the Donald. And what about the idea of him having his finger on the red button, if you will, he having the launch codes. When we come back, dozens and dozens of military guys have come out against Trump saying he is unfit to be commander in chief. But if he wins, would the military have to follow his orders even if he says, legal or not, I'm the commander in chief? We'll ask Iraq war vet and military analyst Mike Lyons what he makes of it.